my final sweep, as you can tell, has taken a toll. Um, I, you know, it's not really a week. It's like two weeks, three weeks of finals. I do a podcast um, on the weekend. My, I edited everything, got the clips. It was a lot. That is why I look like this. And it's midnight and I have class at five. Well, I have class at seven, but I have to wake up at 30. But I just, I don't know. I don't want to sleep yet. So I thought, how about if I read from H.P. Lovecraft? Um, I only know about Cthulhu. So I bought this book from New York Public Library. Readings from New York Public Library. I literally wanted to study in New York just to base off the library. And they give you a little stamp when you buy it. They have so many of these from different like um, books and I just loved it. I loved, I would, like I would have bought them more, <laughs> but like imagine me traveling with <laughs> like 500 books. So I thought let's read one because I do I need to go to sleep. Oh, the call of Cthulhu is so long keeps going. So I think I'm gonna read the festival. The festival sounds like, and I'm sorry if this is gonna be a very like short um, video. Maybe, maybe will be, maybe we won't, but we'll see. Oh, I feel like I should put a disclaimer. Um, I don't know how to pronounce all the words. So <laughs> just, so I'm gonna read the festival. Efficient Demons, it that is another language. <laughs> it was far from home, and the spell of the eastern sea was upon me. And the twilight I heard it pounding on the rocks, and I knew it lay just over the hill where the twisting willows withered against the clearing sky in the first stars of, of evening. And because my father had called me to the old town beyond, I pushed on through the shallow, new fallen snow along the road that soared lonely up to where Aldebron. Aldebaran twinkled among the trees, on toward the very ancient town I had never seen but often dreamed of. It was the Yuletide that men call Christmas, though they know in their hearts it is older than Bethlehem and Babylon, older than Memphis and mankind. It was the Yuletide, and I had come at last to the ancient sea town where my people had dwelt and kept festival in the elder time when festival was forbidden where also they had commanded their sons to keep festival once every century, that the memory of the primal secrets might not be forgotten. Mine were an old people, and were old even when this land was settled 300 years before. And they were strange, because they had come as dark, furtive folk from opiate southern gardens of orchids and spoken another tongue before they learned the tongue of the blue-eyed fishers. And now they were scattered and shared only the rituals of mysteries that none living could understand. I was the only one who came back that night to the old fishing town as legend bade, for only the poor and the lonely remember. Then beyond the hill's crest, I saw Kingsport outspread frostily in the glooming, gloaming, snowy Kingsport with its ancient mounds, lands and steeples, rich pools and chimney pots, wharves and small bridges, willow trees and graveyards, Endless labyrinths of steep, narrow, crooked streets and dizzy church-crowned central peak that time durst not touch. Ceaseless mazes of colonial houses piled and scattered at all angles and levels like a child disordered blocks. Antiquity hovering on gray wings over winter white gables and gable roofs, fanlight and the small panned window one by one gleaming out in the cold dusk to join Orion in the archaic stars. And against the rotting waves, the sea pounded, the secretive, the secretive, immoral sea out of which the people had come in the elder time. Beside the road at its crest, a still high summit, bleak and windsprit, and I saw that it was boring ground, where black gravestones stuck ghoulishly through the snow, like the decayed fingernails of a gigantic corpse. The printless road was very lonely, and sometimes I thought I heard a distant, horrible creaking as a gibbet in the wind. 
They had hanged four kinsmen of mine for witchcraft in 1692, but I did not know just where. As the round wood down the seaward slope, I listened for the merry sounds of a village at evening, but did not hear them. Then I thought of the season and felt that these old Puritan folks might well have Christmas customs strange to me and full of silent heathersid prayer. So after that, I did not listen for merriment or look for wayfarers, but kept on down past the hushed delight farmhouses and shadowy stone walls to where the signs of ancient shops and sea taverns creaked in the salt breeze, and the grotesque knockers of pillared doorways glistened along deserted, unpaved lanes in the light of little curtained windows. I had seen maps of the town. I knew where to find the home of my people. It was told that I thought be known and welcomed, for village legend lives long. So I hastened through Black Street to Circle Court and across the fresh snow on the one full flagstone pavement in town to where Green Lane leads off behind the market house. The old maps still held good and I had no trouble, though at Arkham they must have lied when they said the trolleys ran to this place since I saw not a wire overhead. Snow would have had hid the rails in any case. I was glad I had chosen to walk for the white village had seemed very beautiful from the hill and now I was eager to knock at the door of my people. The seventh house on the left in Green Lane with an ancient peaked roof and jutting second store all built before 1650. There were lights inside the house when I came upon it and I saw from the diamond window panes, <laughs> panes that it must have been kept very close to its antique state. The upper part overhung the narrow grass grown street and nearly met the overhanging part of the house opposite, so that I was almost in a tunnel with the low stone doorstep, wholly free from snow. There was no sidewalk, but many hours but many houses had high doors reached by double flights of steps with iron railings. It was an odd scene, and because I was strange to New England, I had never known its like before, though it pleased me. I would have relished it better if there had been footsteps prints in the snow and people in the streets and a few windows without drawn curtains. When I saw them the archaic iron knocker, I was half afraid. Some fear had been gathering me, perhaps because of the strangeness of my heritage and the bleakness of the evening and the queerness of the silence in that aged town of curious, curious customs. And when my knock was answered, I was fully afraid because I had not heard any footsteps before the door creaked open. But I was not afraid long, for the gowned, slippered old man in the doorway had a bland face that reassured me, and though he made signs that he was dumb, he wrote a quaint and ancient welcome with the stillest and wax tablet he carried. He beckoned me into a low candle-lit room with a massive exposed rafters and dark, stiff, sparse furniture of the 17th century. The past was vivid there, for not an attribute was missing. There was a cavernous fireplace and a spinning wheel at which a bent old woman in loose wrapper and deep poker bonnet sat back toward me, silently spinning despite the festive season. An indefinite dampness seemed upon the place, and I marveled that no fire should be blazing. The high back settled face, the row of curtained windows at the left, and seemed to be occupied, though I was not sure. I did not like everything about what I saw, and felt again the fear I had had. This fear grew stronger from what had been before lessened it, for the more I looked at the old man's bland face, the more its very blandness terrified me. The eyes never moved, and the skin was too like wax. Frankly, I was sure it was not a face at all, but a fiendishly cunning mask. But the flabby hands, curiously gloved, wrote genial genially on the tablet and told me I must wait a while before I could be led to the place of the festival. Pointing to a chair, table, and a pile of books, the old man now left the room, and when I sat down to read, I saw that the books were hoary and moldy, and that they included old Morster's wild marvels of science, the terrible Sedicium Triumphatus of Joseph Granville, published in 1681, the shocking Diamonolateri of Rigamus, printed in 1595 in Lyons, and worst of all, the unmentionable Necromonicon of the mad Arab Abdul al Zarid in Olus Wormus' forbidden Latin translation, a book which I had never seen, but of which I had heard monstrous things whispered. No one spoke to me, but I could hear the creaking of signs in the wind outside and the whir of the wheel as the bonny old woman continued her silent spinning. Spinning, I thought the room and the books and the people very morbid and disquieting, but because an old tradition of my father's had been summoned me to strange 
bestings, I resolved to expect queer things. So I tried to read, and soon became tremblingly absorbed by something I found in the accursed Nomicron. A thought, and a legend, too hideous for sanity or consciousness. But I disliked it when I fancied I heard the closing of one of the windows that the settled faced. As if it had been stealthily opened, it had seemed to follow a wiring that was not of the old woman's spinning wheel. This was not much, though, for the old woman was spinning very hard, and the age clock had been striking. After that, I lost the feeling that there were, per there were persons on the settle, and was reading intently and shudderingly when the old man came back, booted and dressed in a loose antique costume, and sat down on that very bench so that I could not see him. It was certainly nervous waiting, and the blasphemous book in my hands made it doubly slow. When eleven struck, however, the old man stood up, glided to a massive carved chest in a corner, and got two hooded cloaks, one of which he donned, and the other of which he draped around the old woman, who was seizing her monotonous spinning, and they both stared for the outer door. The woman, lamingly creepy, and the man, and the old man, after picking up the very book I had been reading, beckoned me as he drew his head over the unmoving face or mask. We went out into the moonless and torturous network of that incredibly ancient town, went out as the lights in the curtained windows disappeared, one by one, and the dog, steer, le dog star leered at the throng of, throng of cowled, cloaked figures that poured silently from every doorway, and formed monstrous processions up the street, and that, past the creaking signs and antediluvian glabes, the thatched roofs and the diamond pan windows, threading per precipitous Pituous lanes where decaying houses overlapped and crumbled together, gliding across open courts and churchyards where the bobbing lanthorns made ill rich drunken constellations. Amid these hushed, hushed throngs, I followed my voiceless guides, jostled by elbows that seemed per preternaturally soft, impressed by chests and stomachs that seemed abnormally plump, pulp, pulpy, but seeing never a face and hearing never a word. Up, 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 the eerie column slithered, and I saw that all the travelers were converging, converging as they flowed near a sort of focus of crazy allies at alleys at the top of a high hill in the center of the town, where perched a great white church. I had seen it from the road's crest when I looked at Kingsport in the new dusk, and it made me shiver because all the baron had seemed to balance itself a moment of the ghost on the ghostly spire. There was an open space around the church, partly a churchyard with spectral shafts and partly a half paved square swept nearly bare of snow by the wind and lined with unhold Sumlessly archaic houses, having peaked roofs and overhanging gables. Death fires danced over the tombs, revealing gruesome vistas, though clearly falling to cast any shadows. Past a churchyard where there was no houses, I could see over the hill summit and watch the glimmer of stars on the harbor. Though the town was invisible, invisible in the dark, only once in a while, a lanthorn bobbed horribly through serpentine alleys. Alley, alleys on its way to overtake the throng that was now sleep sleep that was now slipping speechless speechlessly into the church i waited till the crowd had oozed into the black doorway until all the stragglers had followed the old man was pulling at my sleeve but i was determined to be the last then finally i went the sinister man and the old woman before me crossing the threshold into the swarming temple of unknown darkness i turned once to look at the outside world as a charged Pro Fisher since cast a sickly glow on the hill top pavement, and as I did so, I shuddered. For though the wind had not left much snow, a few patches did remain on the path near the window, and in that fleeing background, when it looked, when it, when in that fleeing background looked, it seemed to my troubled eyes that they bore no mark of passing feet, not even mine. The church was scarce, lighted by all the lanthorns that had entered lant horns that had entered it for most of the throng had already vanished they had streamed up the aisle between the high white pews to the trap door of the vaults which yawned loathingly open just before the pulpit and were now squirming noiselessly in i followed dumbly down the foot-worn steps into the dank suffocating crypt the tail of a sinuous line of night marchers seemed very horrible and i saw them wriggling into a venerable tomb they seemed more horrible still 
Then I noticed that the tomb's floor had an aperture down which the throng was sliding, and in a moment where we all were descending, an ominous staircase of rough honed stone, a narrow spiral staircase damp and peculiarly odorous, that wound undis un that wound endlessly down to the bowels of the hills past monotonous walks of dripping stone blocks and crumbling martyr. It was silent, shocking descent, and I observed after a horrible interval that the walls and steps were changing in nature as if chiseled chis of the solid rock. What mainly troubled me was that the myriad footfalls made no sound and step up no echoes. After more eons of descent, I saw some side passages or burrows leading from unknown recess of blackness to the shaft of night and mystery. Soon they became excessively numerous, like impious catacombs of nameless menace, and their pungent odor of decay grew quite unbearable. I knew we must have passed down through the mountain and beneath the earth of Kingsport itself, and I shivered that a town should be so aged and maggy with subterraneous evil. Then I saw the lurid shimmering of pale light and heard the insidious lapping of sunless waters. Again, I shivered, for I did not like the things that the night had brought, and wished bitterly that no forefather had summoned me to this primal rite. As the steps in the passage grew broader, I heard another sound, the thin, whining mockery of a feeble flute, and suddenly there spread out before me the boundless vista of an inner world, a vast, fungus shore, lit by a belching column of sick, greenish flames, and washed by a wide, oily river that flowed from abysses frightful and unsuspected to join the blackest gulfs in an immortal ocean. Fainting and gasping, I looked at the unhallowed herbarists of Titan toadstools, leprous fire and slimy water, and saw the cloaked throngs forming a semicircle around the blazing pillar. It was the Yule Rite. Older than man and fated to survive him, the primal rite of the solstice and the spring promise beyond the snows, the rite of fire and evergreen, light and music. And in that Stygian grotto, I saw them do the rite. And adore, uh, and adore the sick pillar of flame, and throw into the water handfuls gouged out of the vicious vegetation which glittered green in the colorotic glare. I saw this, and I saw something amorphously squatted far away from the light, piping noisily on a flute. And as the thing piped, I thought I heard noxious muffled flutterings in the foot to darkness where I could not see. But what frightened me most was that flaming column spouting volcanically from depths profound and inconceivable, casting no shadows as healthy flames should, encoding the nutritious stone above with a nasty, venomous verdigris. For all in that seething combustion, no warmth lay, but only the calmness of death and corruption. The man who had brought me now squirmed to a point directly beside the hideous flame, and made stiff ceremonial motions to the semicircle he faced. At certain stages of the ritual, they did growling obscene, especially when he held above his head that abhorrent necromanicon he had taken with him, and I shared all the obscenities because I had been summoned to this festival by the writings of my forefathers. Then the old man made a single to the half-seen flute player in the darkness, which player thereupon changed its feeble drone to a scarce louder drone in another key. Precipitating as it did so, a horror unthinkable and unexpected. At this horror, I sank, nearly to the election earth, transfixed with a dread, not of this nor any world, but only of, of the mad spaces between the stars. Out of the unimaginable blackness beyond the Gangrey's glare of that cold flame, out of the Tartarian leagues through which that oily river rolled uncanny, unheard, and unsuspected, there flopped rhythmically a horde of tame, trained, hybrid, winged things that no sound eye could ever wholly gasp, or sound brain ever wholly remember. They were not altogether crows, nor moles, nor buzzards, nor ants, nor vampire bats, nor decomposed human beings, but something I cannot and must not recall. They flopped limply along, half with their webbed feet and half with their membrous wings, and as they reached the throng of celebrants, the cold figure seized and mounted them and rode off one by one along the reaches of the unlighted river into pits and galleries of panic where poison springs feed frightful and discover cataracts. 
The old spinning woman had gone with the throng, and the old man remained only because I had refused when he motioned me to seize an animal and ride like the rest. I saw when I staggered to my feet that the Omerfrius flute player had rolled out of sight, but that two of the beasts were patiently standing by. As I hung back, the old man produced his stylus and tablet and wrote that he was the true deputy of my father's, who had founded the Yule worship in this ancient place, that I had been decreed I should come back, and that the most secret of mysteries were yet to be performed. He wrote this in a very ancient hand, and when I still hesitated, he pulled from his loose robe a seal ring and a watch, both with my family arms, to prove that he, he was what he said. But it was hideous proof because I knew from old papers that the watch had been buried with my great 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 grandfather in 1698. Presently, the old man drew back his hood and pointed to the family resemblance in his face. But I only shuddered because I was sure that that face was merely a devilish waxen mask. The flopping animals were now scratching relentlessly at the lichens, and I saw that the old man was nearly as rest restless himself. When one of the things began to waddle and edge away, he turned quickly to stop it, so that the suddenness of his motions dislodged the waxen mass from what should have been his head. And then, because that nightmare position barred me from the stone staircase down which we had come, I flung myself into the oily underground river that bubbled somewhere to the caves of the sea, flung myself into that put putrescent juice of earth's inner horrors before the madness of my screams could bring down upon me all the channeling legions these pest gulfs might conceal. At the hospital they told me I had been found half frozen in Kingsport Harbor at dawn, clinging to the drifting spar that accents sent to save me. They told me I had taken the wrong fork of the hill road the night before and fallen over the cliffs at Orange Point, a thing they deduced from the prints found in the snow. There was nothing I could say because everything was wrong. Everything was wrong, with their broad window shooing a sea of roofs in which only about one in five was ancient and the sound of trolleys and motors in the street below. They insisted that this was Kingsport and I could not deny it. When I went delirious at hearing that the hospital stood near the old church on Central Hill, they sent me to St. Mary's Hospital in Arkham where I could have, have better care. I liked it there, for the doctors were broad-minded and even lent me their influence in obtaining the carefully sheltered copy of Alcerid's object objectionable nomicron from the, from the library of Miskatonic University. They said something about a psychosis and agreed I had better get, an, I better get any harassing obsessions off my mind. So I read again that hideous chapter and shuddered doubly because it was indeed not new to me. I had seen it before. Let footprints tell what they might, and where it was I had seen it were best forgotten. There was no one in waking hours who could remind me of it, but my dreams are filled with terror because of phrases I do not quote. I dare quote only one paragraph, put into such English as I can make from the awkward low Latin. The nethermost caverns, wrote the mad Arab, are not for the fathoming eyes of, of eyes at sea, for their marvels are strained and terrific. Curse the ground where dead thoughts live new and oddly bodied, and evil the mind that is held by no head. Wisely did something say that happy is the tomb where no wizard hath lain, and happy the town of night whose wizards are all ashes, for it is of old rumor that the soul of the devil bought haste, not from his channel clay, but fats and instructs the very worm that gnaws, to out all the corruption horn lift springs, and the dull scavengers of earth Wax crafty to vex it, and swell m monsters to plague it. Great holes secretly are digged where earth pours ought to suffice, and things have learned to walk that ought to crawl. Is it bad that I understood it and I didn't? I love how I said that this was going to be a short video and I'm 24 minutes in. Oh my god, that means it's 1240. That means, wait, no, 24 minutes, 1224. I gotta go to bed. But um, I hope you enjoyed that very short chapter. It's not a chapter, but story. And please do not comment on my very intense eye bags. I just, it is what it is. What can you say?